Merit is California's mission-based investor in affordable housing. We are a proud sponsor of Housing California. We all know how critical it is to build challenging projects, and that is what Merit does. Together, we have created over 10,000 homes and invested over a billion dollars in California. We look forward to continuing this great work with you and seeing you in person next year. Um, and we work with um, advocates and different stakeholders across the state to help push for more affordable housing. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so you guys can see this slide deck, right? Quick thumbs up. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'm really excited to be joined today also by an amazing panel. Um, we have uh, Mayor Sam Licardo of San Jose, Cindy Wu of Bay Area Lisk, Seiron Fu of the Hilton Foundation, and Emily Bradley of the United Way of Greater LA. Um, so just really quick, some kind of table setting here. California, as, as most folks on the call know, is facing historic housing affordability and homelessness crisis that affects every community across the state. COVID has just exacerbated the systemic racial and economic inequities within our housing system and pushed out residents from, from high opportunity, right? Decades of racist inequitable policies translate to lower homeownership rates. We actually have nationally Black homeownership is lower than pre-fair housing law time, which is crazy. Um, higher rent burdens, right? Higher rates of homelessness. California has about 5.5% Black population, and they represent 30% of the unsheltered on any given night. This is just wrong, right? And, and that was pre-pandemic numbers. Um, so how did, we, how did we get here? Right. Um, this crisis wasn't born overnight. Um, it, again, like we said, it's exacerbated by COVID, but existed pre-COVID. Um, rising housing costs, both for renters and home buyers, stagnating wages across industries, and decades of inequitable housing policies have contributed to the problem. So what do we need to do now? Um, it, it's not enough just to rebuild. We must reimagine together our housing system so that no one is left behind. And no one entity or person can do it. We need a variety of stakeholders from advocates, government, philanthropy, business, healthcare, and more so that we can build back better. And although this pandemic you know, hit us hard, uh, we also have an unprecedented opportunity to explore how we want to reimagine and how we want to be, what we wanna stand for and, and how we can come together. As Heather McGee has said, who was you know, the keynote um, earlier this week, the sum of us is so much stronger. Um, and I truly believe that. And, and I think we have such an opportunity um, to be better. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Mayor Sam Licardo. Ruby, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be with you and uh, these really distinguished speakers. Uh, I was uh, told that we'd be talking a bit about private public partnerships and what we can do with the private sector collectively with nonprofits and the public sector to be able to really tackle homelessness and our affordable housing challenges. So I wanna just jump into a couple of things that we've been working on, uh, first on the homelessness front and then secondarily really on the larger task of, of housing generally. Um, so first we'll let's see here, am I able to advance the slides, Ruby? Oh, there we go, let's start here, <laughs> thank you. Um, first, uh, we, we know that student homelessness has become a huge challenge throughout the state of California. A lot of college students, uh, the data is, is horrible. We've seen numbers at some CSUs uh, in the double digits of uh, students who are homeless. We launched a partnership with San Jose State uh, and Airbnb. Airbnb decided to pilot for the first time a third party booking tool on their Airbnb platform that would enable us, and by us, I mean uh, nonprofit Bill Wilson Center working with us with some city money as well, uh, to be able to book and manage stays for students uh, in the homes of many Airbnb participants. Uh, these can be stays for a few days or several months, which is so critical, we know, given the various challenges that, that students face with housing. And so uh, we launched this about a year and a half ago, uh, and it is now being help, is now helping dozens of San Jose State students. Uh, we hope staying housed and getting transitions to more stable housing situations. Uh, if we could go to the next slide as well, 
Uh, this one is, this partnership was with MasterCard. Um, you may wonder what the heck does MasterCard have to do with homelessness? Well, I'm gonna tell you, uh, we have a, uh, an effort that we launched in November called Cash for Trash. Um, and ostensibly this is about uh, essentially paying our unhoused residents to clean up uh, the trash around the encampments where they're living, but it's about much, much more than that. Uh, these payment cards, which we hand out to our unhoused residents, essentially as payment, for every bag of trash that they collect in their community or in our city, and then provide to us on a weekly basis. Uh, this certainly does give them some dollars and just a few, it's about $20 a week. Uh, and it certainly helps us clean up as I think we've cleaned more than 170 tons of trash so far in this program just since November. But what it's most importantly designed to do is to build a bridge. And that is, we know that there's a lot of service resistance among our unhoused residents. We need to be able to reach them and communicate with them to help them get the housing services they need, the mental health and many other services. And what we're determining through this program is that this is a way for us to get an entry, uh, to get some confidence, some trust built with our unhoused community. Uh, we're expanding this program to uh, more than 500 unhoused residents. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, we're up to a little more than uh, 100 today who are routinely receiving uh, this benefit and participating through their own efforts in the Cash for Trash program. Uh, we're hearing from residents in the surrounding areas uh, that this is a benefit to the community. And we hope we can continue to grow this program and build these relationships with our unhoused residents that will ultimately help them become uh, more amenable to services and ultimately get them housed. Um, so obviously there are these kinds of partnerships and we'll continue to, to engage in that really don't have anything directly to do with uh, building housing, but more to do with uh, how we can address a crisis that we all face. Uh, and of course, we know that the challenge that we face in building housing uh, is really monstrous in scale. Uh, in a county like Santa Clara County, where San Jose is located, we have about 10,000 unhoused residents. At least that was pre-pandemic. We'll find out soon uh, how we've done in getting more housed. Uh, and the great challenge of the Bay Area is the cost of housing is tremendous. Just construction alone between $750,000 and $800,000 per unit. Uh, and it takes, of course, three, four, five years in a development cycle. Not a recipe for success if you have constrained resources and you have to move quickly. Uh, and so it's really around building faster and cheaper that we've been really focused on. How do we get more housing stock out there that will be more accessible? So we'll go to the next slide. Um, I think these are very familiar concepts for, for many large cities in particular that uh, have gone deep in prefabricated uh, modular housing and cross laminate timber. Uh, we have a concept called co-living that we've uh, just changed our building code last year to accommodate these much smaller units uh, in a configuration that allows for common use of kitchens and living spaces, uh, but essentially dorm living. We think that's more accessible as a market response to uh, a lot of the need out there for folks who simply, uh, you know, the, the working uh, residents who are, who are struggling just to be able to, to, be able to afford uh, an apartment at market rate. So we're gonna continue to innovate and change our building code to really accommodate these innovations that are all around us, building smaller, taller, and smarter. Uh, but then of course we need partners, and we'll go to the next slide, uh, like Telemi, uh, which has really been helpful in enabling affordable housing builders in particular to be able to find sites that are properly zoned uh, that have permits or uh, that, that can get the permits fairly quickly uh, using a very sophisticated interact interactive web-based map. Uh, and this application helps developers be able to get to their sites where they can build particularly affordable housing at a higher density. Uh, and we hope reduce some of the time burden uh, and ultimately the cost for everyone. Uh, but like many other cities, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see, you'll see a, a, a facing page of a website uh, that we created about two years ago, it's called SJ Backyards. I'm sorry, sjbackyardhomes.org. Uh, like so many cities, we've discovered that uh, accessory dwelling units, ADUs, uh, hold considerable promise for being able to get more affordable housing stock 
out into the, the city and doing so in a way that's very cost effective. And we hope ultimately one that's going to help more uh, of our struggling residents be able to get stably housed. Uh, we know that based on our analysis of the overhead uh, maps, about 125,000 backyards in the city of San Jose are eligible for an ADU. We're a city of about a million people. Uh, and we have done some surveys. We've done a lot of outreach to understand just what is the appetite for more ADUs, for more backyard homes. What we've seen, if we can go to the next slide, is extraordinary success since we launched our effort. And this has been around uh, fast tracking permitting, uh, enabling homeowners to get more information quickly uh, and make it very easy for them. And perhaps most importantly, working with the builders of prefabricated modular ADUs and backyard homes uh, to enable a one day permit approval for pre-approved designs. That is, we have 14 pre-approved designs, and that number will grow over time, that vendors uh, have brought to us saying, this is what we want to be able to market, uh, and we approve them ahead of time so that if a homeowner comes to us, they can get that permit within a day. What we've seen is a tremendous increase in applications and in development. Uh, we're on track to get 1,000 applications this year, uh, which has been enormous growth over the last couple of years. As you can see from the graph, we had a bit of a hiatus of the growth during the pandemic, but we're back on track. And I can tell you last year, more than half of our market rate development in this city was with backyard homes or ADUs at a time when very little building was happening. So uh, we wanna continue to double down on this. And by that, I mean, investing some city money as well to be able to buy affordability in these ADU backyard home units so that we can get rent restrictions in place in exchange for some assistance and getting these projects financed. If we can go to the next slide. Um, Symbium is a, one partner uh, that offers free service for lots of customers to help them understand, will the ADU fit, how big, and how can I do it quickly? Lots of other partners out there in the private sector are helping us do that. And then we'll go to the next slide, which is around financing. Uh, here's one example, 29th Street Capital is a partner. Uh, they're offering 0% loans to a few dozen homeowners. Uh, we launched this product with them uh, a couple months ago. The idea is to see if we can reduce some of that burden, in this case, through a market mechanism. This is no city investment. Uh, you're going to see, I think, in the next few months, a hopefully a partnership that will enable some city investment in exchange for a rent restriction on the unit as well. Uh, but this is an example of what can happen, I think, with financial innovation. Uh, to see how we can help owners, homeowners who struggle many times to be able to get the financing to build. If they don't have the equity, it's going to be very difficult for them to be able to build. And the final concept I just want to talk about uh, in a moment is um, the, the, the challenge around building housing for our unhoused. We know backyard homes are not a great solution for everyone, particularly our unhoused, where we know we're going to need services and management. Uh, and so as we think about the problem I described earlier, the great time and expense of building housing in the Bay Area and really throughout California, um, the solution that we're increasingly finding is one that we can move very quickly on. And we just really experimented with this through the pandemic is on prefabricated modular housing on some public and perhaps uh, not very appealing sites for an awful lot of housing developers. We're looking at sites next to the freeways under the under overpasses uh, in locations where we know market rate builders are really not going to go and we can get the land either for free or very, very cheap. And we're finding ways to build more quickly, particularly with prefab models. In this case, three different projects we were able to build in a matter of 10 months. Uh, and those are now housing more than 300 of our residents. Uh, the construction costs about $110,000 a unit. It's a very small fraction, of course, of what we see out in the market. Um, Private sector partners, if I can go to the last slide here, are really essential here. Uh, we've been looking at several different prefab modular builders. This particular one, Indy Dwells, uh, built, and we're grateful for Sand Hill Foundation. Sand Hill actually jumped in because they saw how fast we were building these. And uh, they said, hey, this is great. We're having a hard time it's in our philanthropy getting anything built. If you guys will build them, uh, we'll throw the money at it and make it happen. They donated several million for this project, and they're now uh, kicking in several million more about five million more for a fourth project will be underway on this summer. And so we think this is obviously emergency housing built during the pandemic. It will become transitional housing 
for unhoused residents as we pull out of this pandemic. And ultimately, if we can get more of these built, we'll have a clear pathway for more of our residents who may have a voucher and simply don't have a place to go, uh, may be able to uh, pay a little bit of rent, but they need to be able to save up for that first month, whatever it might be. This will get them off the street, get them in a safe place in the community with some supportive uh, services, and then off to something more permanent within a matter of months or a couple of years. So those are some of the partnerships we're engaging in the city of San Jose. We know there's a lot of exciting things happening out there and I look forward to hearing more uh, from this panel. Great, that was incredible. I'm sure we all were kind of taking notes on all the different potential um, things that are going on in San Jose and, and specifically kind of public private partnerships. Um, so before we move on to the next speaker, we're going to do some Q&A. So feel free to use the Q&A box here. Um, to kick it off, one thing I just want to ask Sam, or Mayor Licardo, excuse me, is that... Um, it works fine too. <laughs> thanks. Um, you know, one of the things, and you were, you were talking about this throughout your presentation too, but um, has the pandemic affected your response you know, created urgency, facilitated collaboration, specifically public-private collaboration, in any useful way um, that you hope sticks? Well, the, the opportunity that we discovered in the crisis was that you can get a lot of red tape out of the way when you have an emergency order. Uh, in the case of what we're doing with this prefab emergency housing uh, that I described just most recently, you know, Governor Newsom made it clear he was gonna get a CEQA waiver uh, that would attach to all the dollars that they were distributing to cities uh, back in January, February of last year, just before the pandemic. Uh, that enabled us obviously to clear the way. And then with the pandemic emergency orders, all of a sudden we no longer had these multi-year processes for getting things built. Hopefully we have learned from that and recognize uh, that these processes are not always our friends uh, and we need to make the process work for the end product, which is getting housing built for those who critically need it. Yeah. That's great. And, and that actually um, speaks to one of the questions that we got in the, in the chat too about streamlining entitlements, right? And getting through that process. We talked about, you talked about the construction costs, both the time and the cost that it takes for that, but also the entitlement phase can sometimes take a year, two year, three years. Um, and so is there anything that, that you guys are doing? Obviously, it seems like with the ADUs, you guys have really been able to circumvent that time by doing some um, pre-approved designs. Yeah, I mean, I'll be the first to admit cities are tough uh, and we're no exception. Uh, we can be tough too. And we got to be a lot easier if we're going to solve this crisis. With ADUs, yeah, we, you know, it was offering the one day permit, but also putting staff on the job. You know, every city is short in terms of staffing. And we really wanted to focus on this. And we've been putting more and more money in it to really help hold hands because we know that homeowners are not developers. They're going to need more hand holding and they need a lot of folks to be able to help them with every step. And so uh, we haven't done that completely successfully, by the way, we've had a lot of uh, drop balls in the, along the way, but I think we're finally figuring it out uh, and we just need to do more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one last question, and we'll, and we'll have more questions by the way at the end of the session, but just um, you know, one more and then we'll get back to the speakers. Um, how has, you talked about MasterCard, Airbnb, right? There's kind of this entry of new money in this space, particularly tech, tech um, among other capital. How has that helped respond to the housing and homelessness effort? And have, has that money truly been flexible or is there something missing? Yeah, well, certainly we love the innovation that comes from the tech community and the thinking and, you know, they have a sense of urgency, which is great uh, because I have that same sense. Um, the challenge that we often see maybe from the, particularly many of the, the large donations that get the headlines, uh, is that it tends to be fairly um, risk averse money. Uh, and it tends to be in the form of loans rather than grants. And I can understand why people want their money back for obvious reasons. Um, but I think for an awful lot of folks out there on the front lines who are trying to get housing built for unhoused residents, um, we, we need actual dollars uh, that can stay in a project for a significant period of time that don't come right back out in a matter of a couple of years. Um, and we need patient money. And in some cases we need free money. Um, and uh, we would love to be able to see uh, the kind of financial commitments and partnerships that will really enable more of these projects uh, to get built. 
and perhaps uh, a willingness to take some risks with us. Yeah, I love that. So my takeaway is risk tolerant, patient, low cost or free capital. <laughs> we'll take <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Up next, we have Cindy Wu from Beria Lisk. Thanks, Ruby. Um, really great to hear from Mayor Licardo. I'm Cindy Wu, Executive Director of Bay Area LISC. We are a local site of a national nonprofit, and we facilitate the creation of community-centered agendas and drive investment to those agendas. We play the role of investor, technical assistance provider, convener, and advocate. Uh, yes, next slide, please. Um, so in this conversation today about public-private partnerships, I wanted to present the Partnership for the Bay's Future as a cross-sector initiative designed to create and maintain inclusive communities of racial and economic diversity across the five-county Bay Area. The partnership includes philanthropy, CZI, San Francisco Foundation, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Ford. It includes business, Facebook and Genentech as examples, it includes banks, community-based organizations, and government. As has been discussed already, the cost of development is so high in the Bay Area, adding up land, labor, materials. It takes these cross-sector collaborations to achieve the skill influence that we all seek to have and to support the innovation and the creativity in the field. At the partnership, we believe that two things are needed at the same time transformative policy change and significant investment in the bricks and mortars of affordable housing. So the partnership is a $40 million policy fund and a $500 million real estate family of funds. And here at LISC, we manage the family of funds and San Francisco Foundation manages the policy fund. I'll make a quick plug for them. Applications are open for the breakthrough grants currently um, and we look forward to seeing all the applications. Um, so as the fund manager for the family of funds, we first formed the Bay's Future Fund in 2019 and followed with the Community Housing Fund in 2020. We seek to raise and deploy $500 million by 2024 year's end. And we do that bringing the values of being a responsive, collaborative and creative lender. Next slide, please. Um, the Bay's Future Fund offers five products that spans different areas of the affordable housing market, from a product focused on faith-based organizations to one focused on workforce housing, with AMIs really ranging from 20 to 150 percent. The Community Housing Fund has a specific focus on extremely low-income communities and people that are people and families earning 30 percent of AMI or below. So just for making this real, in San Mateo County, that is under $47,000 for a household of three. Um, with the Community Housing Fund, we get a little bit closer to that cheap money that's long-term. Um, the rate can be a 2% fixed interest rate with loan to values up to 150%. Mm. Let's stay on the slide just before. I just wanted to, um, they're not labeled here. The five counties that we work in are Contra Costa, Alameda, Santa Clara, San Mateo, and San Francisco. And I'll go into it a little bit later. We're really working to measure the equity impacts of our portfolio of loans. Um, with that, uh, we can go two slides forward. Thank you. So. Um, because Mayor Licardo is on the panel, I wanted to be sure to tell you about our wins in San Jose and Santa Clara County. Um, since launching the Community Housing Fund eight months ago, we have closed on two projects in San Jose that um, leads to 217 homes and an additional 317 homes to be closing in the upcoming weeks in the broader Santa Clara County. So really excited that those wins are um, coming. Uh, this is where the Community Housing Fund really played a big role with its low cost capital and with our partnership with Destination Home, who provided really important local knowledge about the pipeline of affordable housing that could be um, invested in quickly. Uh, key to homelessness prevention and the larger theme of this panel is getting units on the market as fast as possible. 
as a whole within the five counties, the family of loan funds has financed 22 deals for over 2,100 homes. Um, and we are excited to see what happens in the upcoming years too. Uh, next slide, please. I'll go into details about one project, 155 South 11th Street. This project included many stakeholders. Among them were Grace Baptist Church, First Community Housing, and a local chapter of a fraternity. The fraternity sold the land and First Community Housing is the developer. It will become a project called Lighthouse at Grace, 123 units to be constructed on the site with supportive services and near transit. The partnership for the base future was able to finance both the acquisition loan to acquire the site and a pre-development loan. So this is an example of one of the great projects that we have been able to be a part of. Next slide, please. And then the next. Um, I mentioned earlier that part of our program includes measuring equity impacts. This is important to be clear about our goals and our progress. This wonky table of data is through the first quarter of this year, 2021. Um, one sample of what we measure is simply AMI. We have a goal of at least three quarters of projects being financed to be for people who are earning 80% of AMI and below. We are currently exceeding that goal. We also hold the goal that we are serving people uh, who are VLI, very low income, 50% of AMI and below. We're currently at 14% for the portfolio, seeking to reach 20%. And I think that we'll expect this to get closer to the goal um, with the projects in the Community Housing Fund. Within racial equity, we are tracking the race and ethnicity of the tenants who live in the buildings, um, mostly in preservation projects, projects where tenants are already living in those buildings, acquisitions. Um, this data takes time to come in and it's voluntary by borrowers and developers. The first three projects, the data shows that 95% of the residents identified as people of color. Um, in terms of racial equity data for new construction units, these will take years to construct and lease up and all of it needs to be done within fair housing. Um, and lastly, we're tracking borrowers of colors that we lend to, and that is currently 33% of the portfolio. Um, we can go to the last slide. With that, I'll just give a couple closing remarks. Um, I think key to achieving these equity impacts we have really learned that technical assistance is just as important to the terms of the financing. The projects that come to the fund often have unique challenges or obstacles, and we really allocate staff time differently than a traditional financial institution. It isn't about the least amount of time spent per loan. It's really considering impact beyond dollars. Um, we've demonstrated success with this from supporting emerging, emerging developers who have completed their first projects with us or to um, supporting community land trusts that are supporting, that are preserving housing. So in conclusion, the partnership itself is a cross-sector collaboration, and it really seeks to build the entire ecosystem that's needed to develop affordable housing at scale. Cities, counties, regions, uh, mission-driven affordable housing developers, CDFIs like ourselves, corporations, philanthropy, and community-based organizations on the ground. With that, Ruby, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, I'm not biased or anything. CCI obviously is a part of the partnership for the base future, but uh, it still is an incredible feat. Um, I will, we're gonna hold on Q&A and wait until after um, Sayron Fu and Emily Bradley are gonna speak to us next. Thanks so much, Ruby, and thanks for having us here today. Um, my name is Sayron Fu. I'm a senior advocacy officer with the Conrad Hinton Hilton Foundation, and we're a family family we're a family foundation established in 1944 by the man who started Hilton Hotels, and we provide funds to nonprofit organizations working to improve the lives of individuals living in poverty and experiencing disadvantage throughout the world. Um, that, and that has meant for us a focus on homelessness and addressing homelessness for the past three decades, um, with the last decade focused exclusively here in Los Angeles County. And when Ruby chatted with us about public-private partnerships, um, this was something that resonated with us because in order for us to address 
um, the really difficult problems that we're all facing together as a society, multi-sector partnerships is absolutely a must. Um, and one of the things that we learned um, from, a, from work that we did with Philanthropy U and with um, GSB Labs um, was around specifically putting forth a vision of what multi-sector partnerships could be. Um, and here you can see where we traditionally may see partnerships, um, not with this group of folks, um, but in general, just out in the field. Um, you see the role of philanthropy as a funder, um, the private sector as a barrier, usually the, uh, an obstacle, um, the problem, um, the government as an approver of what is developed, and then civil society as an implementer, not really engaging um, people with lived experience, organizations working with people proximate to the problems um, as a part of the conversation. Um, and, and that has significantly um, raised a lot of issues as it relates to how we work towards these solutions together. And it's not tapping into the full potential of what these public-private partnerships could look like. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and so this is where we're putting forth um, a vision of what, what multi-sector partnerships could look like. Um, with the idea that philanthropy is a facilitator. Um, we're connecting, connecting the various stakeholders together. We're sharing best practices from the field and providing innovative funding. And um, we're seeing the private sector as an accelerator. So you saw from Mayor Licardo's presentation earlier where the private sector is working hand in hand with government, um, working to scale up um, various activities. And then finally, we see so it's civil society as an expert, that people with lived experience, organizations working with um, people most proximate to the problems um, are a part of the solution. And in fact, that's where the solution lies. And before we, I go further, I, a great example of that really is um, here in Los Angeles County, the work of the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness. Um, and that work was led um, here in Los Angeles um, by a group of community stakeholders. And as Jacqueline Wagner, who was the chair of the ad hoc committee said, and she's also with um, Enterprise Community Partners, she said that report reflects a diversity of voices, including people who have experienced homelessness, service providers, and community members, and creates a blueprint for change. And when we're talking about equity and specifically racial equity, that's absolutely crucial to have um, that type, to have civil society centered and be the experts leading and guiding this work together. Um, and so that leads to then our conversation about how addressing the homelessness systems here in Los Angeles. And we've been proud to work with Emily Bradley and the United Way of Greater Los Angeles um, for the last decade in addressing homelessness and retooling really our, the systems that serve people um, in a way that's more equitable and in a way that um, really touches upon um, this multi-sector partnership model that we have highlighted here. So over to you, Emily. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so uh, one of the examples we wanted to bring to you all that is probably a familiar name, but very different across the nation um, is around the coordinated entry system. Uh, but before I dive into this, I'll just kind of give the context of kind of how we come to this space. Um, so I'm from United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Uh, we focus on economic mobility, education, and homelessness. We stepped into the homelessness space with our Home for Good initiative in 2010. So it's been kind of a decades long work of kind of ramping up this multi-sector approach to addressing homelessness um, and increasing opportunities for, for permanent housing in Los Angeles County. Um, and we've stepped into kind of a fractured landscape. Um, I think as many of the stories you know, go that homelessness is no one agency's or entity's responsibility um, that it really does, you know, on the opposite side, take all of us to really address the, the issue and concern. So when, the, when it came down to the coordinated entry system, we, we didn't have a coordinated way by which we were working together. And so the coordinated entry system was our way to build this framework to have a conversation against, that we could work together and collaborate, speak the same language, um, and work towards common goal. Um, so this is kind of how we facilitated that process. How it started was really with the series of pilots um, in one of our hardest hit neighborhoods, Skid Row, um, where we let service providers, frontline leaders, really help be the driving force of design. Um, philanthropy 
was there as a partner in really scaling the next stage after the pilots were done. Um, we brought it to a countywide initiative. It really took philanthropy to really invest in the types of positions, the types of supports needed to build that infrastructure. So it's new positions, new kind of uh, functions that didn't exist in our current systems because they were purely about coordination. They were not about um, service provision. And then kind of on the other side was the, the public sector who served as kind of advisors, supporters, the folks who were going to have to change the policies and parameters to allow this system to exist. And it kind of fits into a little bit of Ceyron's kind of initial framework where uh, you know, the funders were the funders, the public agencies kind of in some ways were working through barriers and were barriers in some ways themselves. Um, and then the service providers were, were there as kind of um, advisors or, or to, you know, to be part of the process um, in, in many ways. But where we're kind of headed, and if you go to the next slide, um, is really kind of changing that landscape to more of what Ceyron kind of promoted as the future. Um, where really kind of homeless service providers, folks with lived expertise are really informing the system. So one of the things that we're currently undertaking is really analyzing our coordinated entry systems um, tools and, and our you know, process by which we're using those tools and really relying on kind of the second you know, section, philanthropy as investing in that support, but research and evaluation, which wasn't baked into our initial process, um, as the as one of the innovation you know triggers that we are going to utilize research as a way to analyze whether our system is meeting the needs of all of those that it's meant to serve and in the ways that it's meant to serve um, and then to utilize the voice of lived expertise the experience of folks who are going through the system the experience of frontline providers who are utilizing this system to make informed decisions and choices about how we move forward with our system not to re not to redo our system, but to refine and improve our system. And in the last section is kind of the public sector. So after we created the, uh, the pilots and scaled them through philanthropy, after a couple years of proof of concept, it became our central system and is now embedded as um, the you know, key data platform, the key uh, you know, administrative tool by which we make um, our, our policy and priority decisions. Um, in how we mobilize our resources, uh, our vouchers, all of those things. And it's managed through our public service system, through our Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Um, and so it's now become from this, this thing that was built you know, through pri private philanthropy and from the providers into a true system that's integrated um, and, and you know, that infrastructure is built into our public system. Go to the last slide. So this is kind of you know how it started, where it's going. But I think the real true magic and the you know the reason I believe so deeply in public-private partnerships is what CES provided us. Uh, it, yes, it was a tool by which we could you know identify the needs of individuals and match them to housing resources that met those needs. But really, it made an infrastructure by which we could collaborate. Um, I think one of the the unfortunate truths of when we started our work is we realized funders and you know the way our resources were allocated was creating competition not an incentive for collaboration and by restructuring where we were investing in regional collaboratives of providers and we we're investing in shared data platforms we created an incentive and supported the providers in doing what they would normally do naturally which is collaborate and we put our money behind that um, and then on the last piece the data fundamental because at the end of the day uh, having a shared system, have, speaking the same language, collecting the same data, provided us with new information. We started our work with the expectation that we had enough resources and we just were not prioritizing them correctly. We were definitely proven wrong. And so um, this data platform provided us with the information to go back to the public and say, hey, we don't have enough to meet the needs of the people who are experiencing homelessness today, let alone the inflow of homelessness we're experiencing in Los Angeles we need more resources and we were able to pass several local ballot measures based on that data and that experience um so our, our measure h bringing incredible amount of you know resources for services proposition hhh bringing resources for housing development most recently our measure j um which you know reallocated our our county budget through a charter amendment um and ultimately also led to the decision that 
the solution to homelessness is housing. And if we don't build the infrastructure on the other side, we are having a pathway to nowhere. And so we needed to be also, you know, you know, increasing our advocacy around affordability, building new types of coalitions like Our Future Los Angeles, which we recently launched, which is intersectional around how do we address all of the needs that are causing homelessness and housing instability, um, and really bringing together groups to do more than we could do alone. But by looking at the issue as more than just homelessness, more than just housing, but this, you know, this continuum of need that, you know, folks are experiencing. And so through this kind of experience, we were definitely reshaping our public and private partnerships, but doing it in a way that truly like brings together the best of all these worlds and works beyond sectors and, and beyond issues to really talk about the holistic needs of people and the holistic solutions that that takes. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was just writing down so many little nuggets of wisdom in that. And um, I think it's really interesting too. One thing that struck me as you were talking with focusing on regional collaboration, shared agenda, the, you know, you had the data component and stuff, but really it also felt like power building um, in a lot of ways and, and building that infrastructure for the long term. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna invite all the panelists back up. We're gonna do some Q and A. Um, I think we have some some questions already in the in the queue. Um, one thing I think um, before I kind of read through these, um, <laughs> one one thing I did want to ask, um, and Sayron, um, I want to start with you and, and Emily, but also others feel free to chime in. What's something I, I love that framework that you had, just kind of outlining how to do public private partnerships, how to think about different stakeholders. Um, are there things you think philanthropy should be doing that it's not? You know, one of the things that struck me when going through that report was the notion that philanthropy, for some of philanthropies that have been created um, to serve communities in perpetuity, um, is funding for the long term. And I think that's really relevant to our conversation here with Roadmap 2030 as well, that housing in California and other partners have released, is what does look, funding for the long term look like? It looks like Roadmap 2030, not just a one-year plan or a two-year plan about addressing homelessness in California, but truly a 10-year plan. What does that look like for us here in the state, working together, philanthropy, government, advocates, and partners and providers um, for a 10-year plan? And, and to be fair, um, there have been funders out there who've been doing that um, long-term work and investing for the future um, and um, for the long-term, but many of us still operate on one-year cycles, one-year grant cycles, and um, some partners here are attending today may, may be going through that process themselves right now. And so how can we think through in terms of um, funding for the future, multi-year grants, and supporting um, our partners in this space? And I'll just add on, um, I think something we saw through our Measure J campaign, which was really moving to an intersectional idea of change, um, was it was really challenging for philanthropy. And I'll put ourselves in this bucket too, because even as you heard in my opening, we were focused on education, economic mobility, and housing and homelessness. Um, so we think in a kind of our buckets, but with that, sometimes we lose the opportunity for these, you know, these cross-issue changes that have, you know, the real potential to accelerate change um, and to build coalitions that are, you know, cross-cutting in a way that, you know, we promoted kind of individual sections. And so I do think that that's an opportunity for philanthropy to think outside of the buckets of funding that we naturally fund in, um, to be thinking about kind of connections and, you know, coalitions across issue areas that we could support. Could I jump in? Yeah, uh, offer, uh, sort of perspective from the public sector standpoint. First, I, I just wanted to say I, I'm really heartened to see uh, a significant move uh, from philanthropy into the space of supporting public sector initiatives, ballot measures that are required. And you mentioned Measure J in, in LA. We had a couple up in uh, my neck of the woods. I'm grateful that Ruby and CZI uh, were there for us. And uh, I just want to say it's great to see philanthropy willingness and their willingness to roll up their sleeves in the political sphere, because critically, let's face it, we all need ongoing uh, tax dollars to be able to support uh, many of our very ambitious efforts. Um, and and then, so I think that's certainly a positive. The one thing I, I would just add is I understand also the uh, the need for philanthropy to be 
focused on evidence-based solutions. Um, but I think we all know we're in a crisis that's going to require us to really innovate and take risks that on, on efforts and issues that had never been tried before. Uh, and so uh, I'm hoping we're going to see uh, a, a growing emphasis on um, those uh, those calculated risks, uh, trying those things that haven't been tried before, even if the evidence isn't there yet, if it's a model that seems promising, let's see if we can at least water it a little bit and see if it'll grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was so interesting too when Emily was talking both in, in your pilot, but also with Partnership for the Base Future with Cindy, um, kind of doing these pilots, testing things out, because it is obviously government using taxpayer dollars to, to you know, a little bit of... Um, trial and error is not as easy as, you know, for philanthropy and others to step into that space. Um, one question that um, came up in the chat, which I think is, is something we're all kind of struggling with a bit, and would love to get the, the public um, side of this. So for Mayor Licardo, but also on the, on the lending side from Cindy, and then also on the philanthropy side, you know, we're all trying to target BIPOC, particularly Black households, right, for, for a variety of things, whether it's, you know, in homelessness, in um, home ownership, um, in lending, right? We talked about in Cindy's presentation, both um, getting BIPOC tenants into the new households, but also borrowers, you know, who are um, of color and fair housing, obviously it comes up a lot as, as a well-intentioned um, legislative kind of body or not body, as, as a well-intentioned law, but also hamstrings our ability to have more targeted interventions. Are there things or examples of thing, of, of policies or efforts um, that folks are doing in terms of how to think about this and, and be more targeted in our efforts? I'll jump in just to talk about the power of housing counseling organizations, that, that technical assistance one-on-one -on -one, helping people navigate applications, um, especially as in the Bay Area region, we're moving more towards centralized applications. I think that's a challenge for people that don't, that there's a digital divide, a challenge for people who English is not a first language. Um, so double down on housing counseling. I, you know, I agree with Cindy, it's certainly an important investment. I, I just want to point out that the spirit of politicians ever offering solutions, just offering more problems. Uh, you know, wrapped up with this, this issue that you just described, Ruby, is, you know, the conflict, I think, in many cities like ours, where we're, we're trying to battle against displacement uh, that we know results from development. Um, at the same time, um, we know that we are reinforcing traditional de jure and de facto segregation in our own cities in various ways uh, when we're saying we're going to make this housing for these people who live here. Um, and, and inevitably, there are racial uh, dimensions to that challenge. And so I just want to highlight that conflict is one that we're really wrestling with, and it's difficult um, uh, to accomplish all the goals I think we, we share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I referenced um, the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness in Los Angeles, and, and I think that report starts off with uh, naming the fact that racism is, is the problem. That, that and, and starting there and that there's a significant effort and need to dismantle that um, in order to address the disproportionate impact of homelessness on, on black um, communities. And so I, I think that's, uh, I'll link the last uh, report um, on, from the ad hoc committee there, but I, but I think naming the systems that are in play um, is crucial for us and, and particularly for philanthropy to continue funding that work. Um, because if it wasn't for the partnership of um, LASA and service providers and philanthropy to have to, to stand up that committee to do that work, um, that we may not have had such a groundbreaking report that explicitly names um, racism as a, as the factor um, for con that contributes to homelessness. And while there are strategies like geographic targeting and things like that as proxies for, um, you know, ways to, to build in equity where fair housing kind of uh, causes barriers, I think the other thing I'll add on is um, one thing we're also looking at is not only like how to get people in, but how to keep people inside. I think one of the things we recognize is that um, Black tenants, and we've you know started some early investigations in LA and are going to have a series of pilots, but Black tenants in supportive housing are falling out at faster rates than other tenants. 
And so it's one thing to, you know, to, to create ways to welcome people inside, um, but it's another thing to make sure that it is truly a supportive environment for all of our BIPOC residents who are coming into our supportive housing spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, um, you know, when thinking about public private partnerships, there can often be skepticism, right, especially if government sector is partnering with some private company, whether it's Airbnb or, or, um, you know, a tech company or whatever it might be, um, you know, whether it's partnership with the base future too, right, we've got multi, all, all of you guys are working with multiple stakeholders in this, you're trying to align on a public good, but sometimes there can be competing interests, how do you navigate that tension. Emily, you're smiling. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll add some thoughts. Uh, so this is where I think um, who you base your work, who you listen to when you build the foundation of your work, right? And so are you centering the work around a community-centered agenda um, that becomes harder as your geography becomes larger? But who who's your advisory committee? Who... Who are you building your ideas from? And then you take those ideas or values into your negotiations, right? And so when you're talking to um, the private side of the public private, uh, what are the impact? What's the impact you wanna have? What's the measurement? And can the contribution of that private entity um, contribute to that impact? And so I think it leads to the really hard position to have a bottom line, in which uh, you'll walk away from a certain participant. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with everything Cindy just said. I just add it's super important to establish ground rules early, uh, that this partnership isn't about promoting your product or service um, for us. Uh, you guys go do that on your own. Uh, this is about uh, what we all agree is a critical community need. And it's important if we can establish those expectations, things go a lot better. I think the other thing too, as I, I feel behind this question as well, is the uh, what I represent is um, we are a funder, but we are also a nonprofit. And there's a there is an you know there is a, a strange dynamic with being a nonprofit who relies on private entities to be able to survive and serve. Um, and so I think it's something that we all struggle with. And I just want to call that out um, that there are it is it is a privilege to be able to walk away from support in a public private partnership. Um, but I think one of the things that we hold to is our ultimate goal. Um, and is there the ability to shape these dollars in a way that if they weren't to go to you or, or in partnership with you may be more harmful than good? I think that is the other way to kind of open that door to say, it, we do table who we can bring along in that journey with us. And so, you know, making sure that you hold to your values, but also, you know, create more space for folks to join where you can support them in advancing their work in a way that is meaningful and impactful. Um, you know, that recognizing the truth and the history there, but, but you know, recognizing that there is also opportunity going forward. That's great. Kind of related to that too, in terms of the role of public-private partnerships, is there a fear ever, and I know this has come up with us even too, um, like can philanthropy replace government, Mayor Licardo? <laughs> in terms of the funding gaps needed. Well, I know there are lots of us who would love for that to happen, um, but you know, I, I, I think a lot of us are skeptical about whether or not the, the ongoing commitment of dollars uh, could ever be sufficient enough. And uh, certainly if tech continues to boom and, and everybody's willing to commit billions and billions, that'd be a wonderful thing. Um, I suspect it, it will be far less consistent than that. Um, and we are going to need government, we're going to need taxpayer dollars, um, and we're going to need engagement of philanthropy in the political realm, in government, to prod people to do the right thing. Yeah, love that. Um, Sayron, would love your thoughts on this, too. As, as, as another funder, I think, you know, we think about this a lot, too, of like, no, 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 we're just, you know, catalytic capital. <laughs> I always put this in context, right? So... The philanthropy in California provides grant making somewhere on average about 16 billion a year, right? Um, the state budget that was just adopted, uh, granted it was a record breaking year, was well over $200 billion. 
and, and so it, just the, the scale, and let's not even talk about the three um, COVID relief bills passed by the federal government and the amount of dollars put into local governments, state governments, um, and, and public systems um, and direct cash to people that simply philanthropy can't, um, can't replace, right? Um, I think where we can be particularly helpful is sometimes the, there is hesitancy in addressing a particular issue. Um, and if there's a body of, of, of work um, developed with people um, that can demonstrate what good policies look like, I think there's real opportunity there. Um, and I'm just the example I just think about is the work that funders have been doing with part with in partnership um, with former Mayor Tubbs around um, direct cash assistance, right? The seed work in Stockton and how with, there's a, a, now a national conversation and, and work with nonprofit partners as well. But there's a national conversation of what this looks like. Um, and various pilots popping up and, and converse and, and even in the state budget that was um, proposed, like there were conversations there as well. So th there is a role for philanthropy to work with partners and communities to help develop um, some of the contours of what that policy could look like. But it's government really, that partnership with government to be able to take that, persuade um, the policymakers and, and then go from there. Yeah, like that. And maybe I'll just supplement what Sharon said. I, I really agree with this point about the scale, but there's a lot of not very sexy things um, that government does. Uh, you know, running a meth rehab program, uh, it's not going to attract a lot of philanthropic dollars, but government's got to do it. So, you know, I think we all just need the workhorse of government to do its job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, as you guys are thinking about some of these public private partnerships are very localized, right? And part of that is on purpose to do some proof of concept, you know, work on scale. Um, but how do you guys think about that when you're engaging in these partnerships? How do you, how does um, thinking about both scalability, especially at the state level, if not federal, factor into your decision making? If at all, <laughs> maybe it's like. <laughs> well, I'll just jump in. Uh, I talk too much anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, half the time we'd just be happy if they all just get out of the way. Uh, you know, it's. Um, but but you know, in the last year, suddenly there's this money that's flowing from you know stimulus relief uh, packages and and everything else, and you know, it's like man has fallen from heaven. So we're all thrilled to, to, to chase all these dollars in any way we can. Um, I suspect all that, that spigot is gonna kind of dry up pretty quickly in the next year or so. We all wish it would continue. Um, and, and then we're probably gonna go back to just saying, well, you're gonna have to keep finding solutions on our own. You know, federal government, you know, has never made a major investment in homelessness in several decades. I would love for this administration to be doing I'm sure they would like to be doing more. Obviously, there's a Congress, they have to move with them. Um, I, I'm just skeptical to what extent we're really going to see massive federal intervention at a scale that's really needed to tackle homelessness. Thinking about scalability, so our, the partnership covers five counties. Um, as it stands, the five counties are really different from one another. So there's been good learning about um, what's needed in the ecosystem in each county. So I'll just pivot to plugging BAFA, the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority, because I think that with BAFA, there's the opportunity that it doesn't have to be a bespoke process in every county and city, and that maybe scalability, there can be a process to finance or um, develop more broadly housing that doesn't have to be so custom to every single loan. Um, but I think that something like the partnership can test maybe what, what best practices are and raise them up, um, but I'm really putting a lot of hope into BAFA. Yeah, plus one to that. And I know in LA, they're working on a similar regional entity too. So um, this regionalism approach is catching on. Um, one thing I, I wanna ask, uh, we're almost at time here, but um, you know, it was striking to me, Emily, to hear a little bit about the pilot that you guys were working on in LA and the learnings along the way. And Cindy, I know 
Um, you know, the partnership has learned a lot and, and also adapted um, because of COVID among other, um, and also just being responsive to community needs. Um, what I, I was hoping that you guys can speak a little bit about some of the biggest challenges or barriers that you guys have faced um, and, and how you've been able to overcome them. Um, I think one of the things that, that we always face is, I mean, we've been a 10 year long initiative um, and public patience with the, with the issue of homelessness is short. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have kind of changing administrations in public, you know, in public sector. Um, we have a public who, you know, in LA, 75% of our, our population um, is unsheltered. And so it's very visible. And so I think how we keep moving forward towards long-term solutions while showing true change in ways that people can connect with has been something that we've we've tried and you know struggled with but would but tried to push forward and a lot of that comes through i think through our messaging uh we have a you know a countywide campaign that was launched after the passage of our, our measure h ballot measure um called everyone in and really you know one of the purposes is to showcase this, you know, the impact that people don't get to see. Um, and so, we, you know, on average, LA is housing over 20,000 people permanently every single year, but people don't recognize that they only see the tent on, down the street. And so we need to be able to be better messengers to the public, um, to be better partners to our, 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 you know, our elected officials and our public agencies to give them, you know, for lack of a better word, cover um, for to be able to stay true to the long-term solutions. And I think those have been challenges, but those have also been ways that we've been able to create new platforms and new opportunities to, to create connectedness amongst our service providers and our public sector leaders and, and to create, you know, we never thought we would create a, a messaging campaign across our coalition, um, but the opportunity rose and it has led to so many other things because we've been able to stay on message together as a united front. Mm -hmm. I'll offer two thoughts. One is that these large scale structured funds often take years to build up and uh, the market conditions can change by the time you hit deployment. So one thing that we built into the um, Partnership for the Base Future family of funds is that we could change the products along the way, that that, that um, flexibility was built in. And so we, in COVID, have added transitional housing as a use. We've added rehab only. Um, so buildings were existing, that are existing affordable where tenants live as a use um, to, see, to, to basically reach more of the market to meet more need. Um, the second thing I'll offer is that, uh, a big challenge I, um, is that CDFIs should be pushed to expand the pie also. And I think that efforts like the partnership, or earlier you had asked a question about what philanthropy can do. I think that um, CDFIs can sometimes act in uh, competition with one another, but actually the more that we can all be pushed to expand the pie in, in separate directions, if possible, the more that we can address the need, right? Um, doesn't feel like housing is getting easier in the Bay Area. Um, and so let's all try to approach this in a different way of um, coming up with solutions with those that are in the same um, industry that we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm plus one, both of those comments. I just might also add that, you know, as we think about what Emily is saying about really trying to ensure we're bringing the public along because let's face it, at least in the public sector, they're paying for this and we need to bring taxpayers along uh, to support this. Uh, we need to constantly think about how we broaden uh, the appeal of what we're doing beyond sort of the ideological base of those of us who think we simply have a moral obligation to do something. Um, so for example, efforts we're launching to engage an entire community or part of a community that we're housing and actually helping to clean the city and get jobs, they're being paid of course, um, to, to uh, be out there beautifying our city. We've actually have entire group uh, adopting a park, repairing it, bringing it back to life. And these are unhoused residents now housed and showing the entire community what the value is. Uh, what, regardless of what your ideological leanings are, the value is of being able to help people get back on their feet and, and showing that they want to be part of the solution. They, they're, 
they are not simply there to be pointed as the problem. And I think the more we can invest in those efforts that really broaden our, our, our ideological tent in supporting homelessness solutions that are going to be really important. Yeah, I love that. The just yes, plus one. <laughs> one final question um, before we wrap. I mean, I, I think this whole panel, right, was about public private partnerships, how they can help in the housing space. Um, but, you know, and, and obviously some of the challenges with them and everything. Um, I think it would be great to hear from everybody, you know, do you, why do you place value in public private partnerships? Just like the core of like, you know, do you think that it is something that will actually move the needle? Um, and if so, what's missing in order to get more? Hmm. <laughs> well, I, I absolutely believe in it because I, I know too well, having been in city hall for all these years what the limitations are of, of governmental action. And I think everybody knows them well. Bureaucracies don't move quickly. We're not very nimble uh, very often. Um, and we never have enough resources. Uh, we also benefit enormously from the creative thinking, innovative thinking of the ecosystem around us, of private and nonprofit and philanthropy. And so um, these partnerships are really essential for those of us in, in government because um, otherwise we will continue simply rolling the same rock up the same hill. And, and I think we all sense that there are better ways out there. And when we're working together, we're able to find them. Well, I'll echo those sentiments, I think. Scale of resources, pulling in different kinds of resources. Um, although we all want the cheap free money, I think that uh, often loans can come at a different scale than grant money can come at. So, so getting leverage that way. Uh, the different roles that the different entities can play, who can test something, who can innovate something and then who can take it to scale. And uh, those are things I heard today um, that I think will always have value. You know, for us here at the foundation, one of our core values is the idea of thinking big. And for us to do that, it requires a large um, tent of people working together. Um, and we've always talked about how the, the, our grant making is always going to be smaller than our ambitions. Um, and, and that's intentional um, because we there is a there's an effort to work together to address some of those difficult questions and problems that we face together. And so um, this collaboration is, is definitely not an end, it's a means, right, to, to the outcomes that we want. Um, and we've been able to have fabulous partners like United Way, like you, Ruby, at CZI, um, to match those ambitions. And yeah, I think you have a panel of very biased folks uh, since we all work in this space, but uh, I agree. I like wholeheartedly believe that we can do more than uh, together than we can do alone. Um, I definitely, but I also think, you know, kind of to echo that it's very important, but it's also like how we work together and, you know, how we partner and what we partner on that really matters. And so I think being thoughtful about how you approach your public private partnerships, you know, not in name only, but really like in core goals and, you know, strategies and being true partners at the table um, in the ways that we can is really ultimately important to, to moving the needle forward um, so that, you know, and, and really I do believe that is through public private partnerships, um, but true partnership is at the core of that. Yeah, I like that true partnership, building trust, super key. Okay, so with that, thank you guys so much for all of your time and wisdom and everything. I learned so much on this and I'm so excited to share this space with you. I'm gonna pass it to Michael Duarte, one of the Housing California board members, who's gonna close us out. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ruby. I would like to thank all of our speakers today for sharing your expertise on how to leverage and grow uh, public and private partnerships to get to solutions at, at scale, um, as envisioned by California's road roadmap Home 2030. I'm Michael Duarte, Chief Real Estate Officer at Fresno Housing Authority and a proud uh, board member at Housing California. Um, the topic of today was of particular importance to me, and um, we couldn't have had uh, a better set of speakers today, uh, including San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo. Thank you for being here. Next, uh, please make sure to visit our virtual exhibit hall for a chance to win some exciting prizes. You can also take, uh, take 
uh, calming and mindful break with uh, by joining meditation and movement with Jeff Napier. And, and last, we look forward to seeing everybody at 245 for music by hip hop artist and community leader Clean before our, our closing keynote and, and kitchen table talk with guaranteed income pioneer Michael Tubbs in conversation with Chris Hone, the executive director of California Budget and Policy Center. Thank you all very much.